Welcome to our latest video presentation. Ben, Lee and myself are going to talk in just a minute about some of the really interesting works in this contemporary catalogue, a catalogue that feels quite close and similar to our very first catalogue from 2007, the Accents on Contemporary Art. All of the works will be on view here for the next couple of days until the auction is coming Thursday, August the 6th at 6.30. And now we're going to have a bit of a, a wander through some of the really interesting and diverse works in the current catalogue. This catalogue is a bit of a monster by our usual standards. I think normally we have around 60 or 70 lots. In this sale we've got 110 lots. So quite a challenge getting it all installed and looking around. The room is as busy as it's ever been for one of these catalogues. But uh, one of the paintings that sort of anchors the, the room and anchors the show, I feel, is this magnificent Peter Robinson canvas from 1997. On Thursday night, the artist opened a show of new work. So it seems prescient to talk about his painting. I mean, his work just continues to evolve and push the boundaries of contemporary art making in this country, and I think in one of the most exciting ways imaginable. This canvas from 1997 takes as its inspiration the Museum of New Zealand Te Papatonga Rera's signature motif or design or sign, the wonky kuru or thumbprint designed by Saatchi and Saatchi. You can see that there, it's the spiral motive, this wonky coro is something that Robinson utilises a lot and works from this period. It's underscored or underlined by the most simple of words down the bottom there, ha. Huh. I think Peter Robinson draws their attention both to his inability to comprehend how the Museum of New Zealand could put such an inordinate amount of time and money into a design logo, but also I think how many of the New Zealand public feel when confronted with contemporary painting of a more conceptual basis. A lot of the conversation in New Zealand art tends to centre on the dark and brooding nature of the New Zealand psyche as it's represented in our visual arts. Well here's a work that bucks the trend. This is Pat Hanley's Golden Age from 1979. It was a period, almost an Arcadian period, where Hanley's fertile imagination felt almost Mediterranean, full of bright colours, sensual forms and the interactions of family groups and lovers. This particular Golden Age from 1979 really shows how close in many ways that Hanley got to the Arcadian view of Picasso with these voluptuous forms, with the bright sh shots of colour. But of course, this work is very much located within the New Zealand context because there we have the Southern Cross in the upper portion of the painting. Absolutely delightful. Hot on the heels of Michael Parakofi's many international successes at the Venice Biennale in 2011 and following at the Key Bronley Museum in Paris, and more recently, earlier this year, at Goma in Brisbane, we're delighted to offer a number of pieces by this varied and dynamic artist. Michael Parakofi must surely be one of the most ambitious and exciting artists working in the contemporary art scene in New Zealand today. And the variety of works that we have in the catalogue truly represent this. Parakofi's varied practice includes photography and sculpture, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Not so often seen are the two photographs behind me entitled, You're My Best Friend, and aren't they impossible to miss? Slightly more subtle are two of the other sculptures included in the auction, Rainbow Servant Dreaming, up there on the wall, and the bronze tree here, entitled The Moment of Cubism. So an interesting variety of Michael's work included in the catalogue, and a great opportunity to come along and see a lovely collection of his work together. As Hamish mentioned, the accent on this catalogue is definitely contemporary. The vast majority of works have been produced after 1990 and amongst it there are some real gems. I think uh, behind me is one. It's John Poulet's uh, 1992 work called Untitled. I think it's one of the finest Poulets we've uh, had the opportunity to offer. It takes as its inspiration as you can clearly see the art of Pacific tarpa making or as they call it in Niue, Kiapo. Niue is a country that's got the most fantastic and fascinating history. I think it was missionized very early on and then I think that Captain Cook gave it the name Savage Islands, which it carried for a very long time, right into the middle of the 20th century. He called it Savage Islands, I think, as a result of being unable to land there in UA. I don't think there's a lot of beaches there. Really, it's a rocky little island there, right in the Pacific. Captain Cook and his crew were attacked there when they tried to land on the island, and since then it's carried the name Savage Island right through the mid-20th century. All of these types of, of histories are very much encapsulated in Poulet's work. Poulet has been painting, writing poems, writing novels and short stories, and of course printmaking over a 25-30 year period now, as all part of this kind of this grand narrative around Niue's place in the Pacific 
and his own place as a Polynesian migrant in New Zealand, I guess. And these play out in a wonderfully interesting and cryptic fashion in works such as these. As I say, they take as their basic structure the art of tapa. Then Pule introduces these elements, these little narrative snippets. In doing so, he takes an ancient art, documents it, but also in a wonderful generative fashion, sees that it will never be forgotten in fact. The art of tapa and his painting is perhaps more full of life than what it's ever been. Bill Hammond's work of the 1980s is very different from, of course, his famous Buller's Birds works, which appeared in the mid-1990s. These 1980s works, these rock and roll works, are very much uh, centered around a dystopian view of very much Bill Hammond world. In this particular canvas, like many from this period, we're riffing on rock and roll. Witness, witness, can I get a witness? Is a classic song title from this period. And what we see here is some subterranean recording studio in which Hammond's classic anthropomorphs writhe, boogie, sing, declaim, and talk to a genuine sense of unease. These are kind of very much post-punk works, and they reveal that Hammond's worldview at the time was one of impending chaos and potential doom of course leavened with his signature humour. And as your eye travels across this particular work with its classic custody, magenta, marine silver palette, you start to see all these wonderful little details which travel throughout Hammond's career. The devil, very much, is in the detail of a work such as this. Del Frank is an Australian artist who will be well known to art watchers on both sides of the Tasman. He's had a long and storied career and he really occupies an interesting and unique place in the conversation around abstraction. Because of course, what we see in a work such as this is a work that's throwing ley lines back to the beginnings of abstract expressionism in the 1950s, but with eye-popping colour and palette. This work from the mid-2000s has come from a collection in Melbourne and posits almost like a Rorschach test in that it feels like an opening book. And what we have in these works is the fugitive, the elemental forces of the liquid paint as they move around and coagulate and interact very much like a, a force of nature. There's a sense of biology in these works, but of course they're all held together by Dale Frank's wonderful eye and ability to hold the composition together in a way uh, that is just on the edge of chaos, but which ultimately presents as a wonderful and elegant essay on painterly management and composition.